Hello, I'm Tom Hodgkinson and I'm here for another episode of Idle Talk uh, and today I'm talking to Dr Matthew Green here. Matthew came into the Idle Academy in London about two years ago and asked whether we'd be interested in a talk on the history of the London Coffee House and particularly the 18th century. Um, I said yes immediately because one of our inspirations for the Idle Academy was my idea at least of the 18th century coffee house because I knew that there were kind of hubbubs of conviviality uh, the kind of place where Dr Johnson and um, Boswell would go and hang out with Top and Beauclerk and the other rakes of London town um, and, it, and, and here was the sort of world's expert <laughs> coming into our shop and he gave an absolutely beautiful uh, fascinating and uh, very well written talk uh, in the shop about the history of the coffee houses and we've been working together since then. Um, so Matthew what was it that got you into the subject in the first place? Well I found uh, a secret diary um, of this law student called Dudley Ryder um, in which he mentions coffee houses. He was writing in 1715 and uh, I was just struck by how integral these establishments were to his kind of daily life. He was going into sort of five, six different coffee houses each day and the kind of um, things that went on inside were extraordinary and they seemed alien compared to what would go on in a, you know, your average Starbucks or Cafe Nero today. Uh, for instance, you could sort of walk in, uh, sit down next to anyone you'd like the look of and just sort of talk about the latest news or have a, a, a debate about the Cartesian dream argument, something like that for, you know, late into the night and then leave. And it made the London we live in seem so kind of anonymous and atomized. In contrast, and it sort of got me thinking, you know, why is it that you could behave in such a sort of outwardly convivial way back in the 18th century, whereas it seems sort of, you know, if you did that today, you'd be treated as a bit of a, a freak. A lunatic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, what, so culturally, it must have been very different. Do people just have more time on their hands to hang out in these coffee houses and just sort of chat? I think, yeah, amongst a certain sort of section of society, um, I mean, the there were idlers aplenty in the 18th century. If you were a law student like this Dudley Ryder guy was, or if you were a member of the kind of landed gentry, um, even if you were a shopkeeper and you were doing quite well, you, you would have time. Um, and today, you know, it's just a mad frenzy. You know, people are just eating lunch at their desks and you barely have time to kind of gather your own thoughts, let alone uh, debate uh, philosophy in a coffee house. Um, so there is that. Um, but then at the same time, I, I think it goes deeper than that. Um, it's about the whole kind of philosophy of like living in a big city. You know, the London is like booming in terms of its population when this is happening. And they, they have these theories about how kind of interacting with strangers is, is good for you. Um, and today, I think we need the alcohol to lower the barriers. Um, I mean, I, I certainly don't turn up to a coffee shop and just sit down next to a stranger and start talking about whatever I feel like because it would know, be rude. Yeah, it would be considered somewhat impolite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 You don't see that... Is there any possibility of that changing? I mean, has anyone tried to do a real 18th century style coffee house in London that you know of? Uh, well, I mean, you, you've gone some of the way. I, I'd say the Idler is like the Grecian coffee house, which was the, the one where they had all the philosophy talks and Isaac Newton used to dissect dolphins in there. Um, <laughs> they had so, talks in them as well? Yeah, they had talks really? in them. Yeah. yeah, people used to go and sort of predict when the end of the world was going to happen and all sorts of other things. Um, but in terms of recreating it, I don't know if you can because you'd be sort of legislating downwards, sort of saying you must all interact. Um, you, know, you could try, one of the things they had was these like long communal tables and that was integral to it because you had to sit next to, you know, yeah. like we're doing now on a bench, yeah. next to someone perhaps who you hadn't met. So conversation was an inevitability. You could try putting communal tables, you could have a philosophy table, a literature table, a policy, but it, it might seem a bit contrived. And I think what I've discovered is that in the 18th century, it was organic and there yeah. was this amicable collision of factors that yeah. gave birth it, to it. It was and unplanned. It was unplanned. Well, it wasn't planned by a central authority or anything like that. No, no, it was a fortuitous alliance. Uh, a lot of it was to do with news and because the censorship laws lapsed and there was this kind of explosion of newspapers. So news itself was a bit of a novelty and that was yeah. a perfect way to start a conversation with someone. Whereas today we've, we've got so much news and it's sort of, you know, we're bombarded with it from our smartphones almost into a state of apathy um, in places. So, so I think it would be tough, but I, I wouldn't give up hope. Um, you know, certainly we've got these small independent coffee shops that are sort of sprouting all over London and, and they do echo, you know, the spirit of the original ones to some extent, if not all. It, it could potentially come back if there, if there was a, if something shifted in the culture, perhaps. Um. Yeah, I think um, people are worried that this whole kind of virtualization of society has got a bit out of control and gone too far. And, you know, when you 
uh, you know, you go into a tube carriage or a coffee shop and everyone is plugged in to their smartphone or they're tapping out tweets or something. Um, you can already see the rumblings of a movement, which is like, let's actually, you know, not get rid of that, but tone it down and actually sort of uh, you know, preach the virtues of kind of face to face interaction. Um, a lot of writers are sort of harping on that theme and, you, you know, it's not a, too much of a leap to then get someone like you to just say, well, let's jam the mobile phone signal in, in the coffee shop so people can't use them or even ban them altogether. And it would be extreme, but, you know, you'd, you'd get a lot of attention and people might even... Like I, think, I think there are some cafes which are starting to do that. You really? Know, no laptops and no phones. Yeah. Right. Have you thought about doing that? Um, we're, we're a bit too nervous at this point. Yeah, you know, it could be commercial suicide. We don't, we don't suicide. lose all our, all our Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because yeah. 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 it, it, nice, it is nice also to offer a, a place where someone can go and sit in the garden with their laptop and work. Yeah. And that, 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 that seems sort of fairly harmless, actually. Yeah, and, and that's actually uh, in keeping with the tradition because a lot of these early coffee houses, you know, Lloyd's, Jonathan's, Garraway's, they were the first real sort of offices and marketplaces as well. So, uh, and they throw some, some magazines were based in, in the coffee houses, weren't they? That was yeah. to be their dress. Absolutely, yeah, like the Spectator and the Tatler, which Joseph Addison and Richard Steele wrote, they, they used to edit that inside. And the Athenian Mercury, which was the first ever, as you know, the first ever question and answer journal the kind of google of the 17th century was in smith's coffee house which was in cornhill and, and the public were invited to um submit questions about the world and how it worked and you know conundrums about courtship so agony on column stuff basically then these people would go away and research it and publish the answers and, and the coffee house was the kind of lightning rod for all those kind of you know inquiries and and answers so a, lo a lot of great stuff came out of them they were like incredibly sort of creative melting pots and again we've lost when I mean, we've just lost that you know most in what comes out of all the coffee shops in, in london they're, they're sort of places you go aren't they to sort of punctuate the day they're not sort of destinations in in their own right not all the time anyway and how can we find out more on this subject i know you've written a pamphlet for the idea which yeah. we published and yeah. um there's, there's, you've got some other activities yeah um i run uh, immersive tours of uh, London and one, one of our biggest hits is called the Coffee House Tour which takes you on this sort of uh, journey past the kind of hallowed sites of all the, the, the sort of trailblazing coffee houses and we hide actors and musicians in sort of Georgian attire in the alleyways and they sort of leap out bring it to life and most importantly you get to taste what that coffee was like in the 17th century and it was vile it was you know it, was, it used to be called sort of bitter Mohammedan gruel because um, <laughs> it was the effects you know people loved the way it stimulated conversation and debate and sobered you up, the taste was, was, was horrible. So, so you get to, to try that sort of discuss, I don't know how much of a, a good sort of marketing ploy that is, but you get to really sort of taste what they tasted mm. and see what it did to their brains yeah. in the very sites where this sort of intellectual awakening took place. Yeah, and we do those every uh, month, usually the third Saturday of every month. So uh, that, that's Unreal City Audio. Just Google Coffee House Tour and it will come up. Okay, great. Well, um, and you've got a book coming out Yes. in 2015? 2015, yeah. I'm slaving away. Uh, it's called A Time Traveller's Guide to London. So it's uh, 2,000 years of London's history. Um, and the conceit is that the, the time traveller is dropped in as a pivotal moment in London's history. And you're sort of guided on a sort of historical joyride. So you sort of soak up the sights, sounds, smells and tastes of the city um, at various points in its history. And it, it's kind of immediate. It's written in the present tense. So it's like you're actually there. So I'm hoping it, it'll be sort of more transportive than a lot of the London histories that are on the market at the moment. Great. Well, Matthew, thank you very much. Thank you.